Welcome to this installment of Idaho Department of Fish and Game's State of Deer and Elk series. My name is Ryan Walrath, a wildlife manager with the Idaho Department of Fish and Game. In this video, I will talk about antlerless harvest management and the role it plays in managing herd productivity and achieving deer and elk management objectives. Public opinions about antlerless harvest often vary across areas and species. There is a common misperception that harvesting females is always bad for herds, when in reality, antlerless harvest can increase herd productivity and health, depending on the status of the population and its habitat. Other misconceptions include that antlerless harvest will reduce or eliminate populations, that it will ruin the hunting for big bucks, or that state wildlife management agencies only support antlerless harvest because they want to generate money by selling more tags. Conversely, sometimes personal preference drives opinions on antlerless harvest, with some hunters simply preferring to harvest antlered animals and viewing antlerless hunting opportunity as less desirable. Antlerless harvest of deer and elk can be an effective tool, but it does not have equal applicability across all deer and elk populations in the state. The primary benefits of antlerless harvest as a tool for wildlife management are to maintain herd health and maximize fawn and calf production. Additional benefits of antlerless harvest include the ability to address social concerns such as agricultural depredations and urban wildlife and to provide additional hunting opportunity. When conditions are favorable, wildlife populations tend to, to produce more new animals than are necessary to replace losses from deaths. In this simple example, eight calves were produced and three total elk died, resulting in a net increase of five elk. This surplus production allows populations to recover from times when conditions are not favorable, like severe winters or die-offs due to disease, and those animals quickly occupy available habitats. How quickly a population grows through reproduction is called productivity. Productivity varies among the deer and elk species in Idaho. White-tailed deer have the highest productivity because they almost always have twins each year, sometimes even triplets, and does can reproduce for the first time at as early as six months of age. Mule deer have just slightly lower productivity because they typically produce twins each year, but does typically don't breed the first time until they are yearlings. Elk have the lowest productivity of the three because they tend to only produce one calf per year, and cows typically don't breed the first time until they are two and a half years old. Within a population of any species, productivity can also vary year to year for a variety of reasons, including habitat quality, weather, disease, and the number of animals on the landscape. The maximum number of animals that a habitat can support without damage to the habitat is called habitat carrying capacity. As the number of animals on the landscape increases and approaches habitat carrying capacity, there is less food for each animal to eat, resulting in animals being in poorer body condition and less likely to successfully reproduce, which in turn results in low productivity during the breeding season. Over time, this trend can result in a population comprised of a high proportion of adult females, many of which are past prime reproductive age, which lowers productivity even further. Conversely, when there is ample food for all because the population is well below habitat carrying capacity and most of the adult females in the population are younger and in prime reproductive status, productivity can be high. That shift in population structure and productivity can often be accomplished through antlerless harvest. Wildlife managers strive to manage deer and elk populations at levels that maintain high productivity but don't exceed habitat carrying capacity. Maintaining high levels of productivity results in consistent high fawn production and recruitment with roughly half of those fawns being males that go on to provide the buck hunting opportunity in future years. Keeping populations under a habitat's carrying capacity assists with maintaining good habitat conditions which lead to good body condition for individuals in the population, which, in turn, can lessen the impacts of environmental events, such as severe winters, 
which when they occur can cause even larger scale die-offs if animals are in poor body condition. The Idaho Department of Fish and Game monitors a variety of mule deer population metrics as indicators of herd health status and where the population is in relation to habitat carrying capacity. Common measurements include December fawn and calf weights, adult female mortality rates and causes of mortality, overwinter fawn and calf survival, December fawn to doe and calf to cow ratios, December adult body condition measurements, and the age structure of the population. Staff evaluate trends in these measures over time. For mule deer that use Game Management Units 39 and 43 for summer and transitional ranges and primarily winter in Game Management Unit 39, December fawn weights, overwinter fawn survival, and December fawn to doe ratios have been trending down over time. These trends suggest that the deer population may be approaching what the habitat can support and that resources are limited. Taking this example a step further, this graph shows the relationship between mule deer winter population estimates and average December fawn weights in Unit 39 from 2004 through 2023. The blue line represents data related to average mule deer fawn weights with values for this data reflected along the right vertical axis. From 2004 through 2013, abundance estimates ranged from 23,000 and 26,500 mule deer and average fawn weights in the solid blue line were consistently above the long-term average of 75 pounds. From 2014 to 2023, the one abundance estimate conducted suggested that there were closer to 29,000 mule deer in the population and average fawn weights were lower than the prior 10-year time frame, reflecting a downward trend in fawn weights over this 20-year period. This combination of information suggests to biologists that the system may be resource limited for the number of deer on the landscape and that fawns were heavier when the population was lower. Heavier fawns tend to correlate with higher overwinter survival rates, which for hunters means more bucks on the landscape during future hunting seasons. Because of the high reproductive rates and growth potential of white-tailed deer, moderate antlerless harvest tends to not reduce healthy populations, but it can assist in maintaining highly productive populations and can be used to reduce localized populations that are a social concern such as agricultural depredations or urban deer. To demonstrate the productivity potential of white-tailed deer in Idaho, we will look at statewide harvest, most of which occurred in North Idaho between 1996 and 2007. White-tailed deer in Northern Idaho experienced a die-off event from the severe winter of 1996 into 1997, as reflected in the reduced statewide white-tailed deer harvest between 1996 and 1997. Portions of North Idaho then experienced outbreaks of epizootic hemorrhagic disease in a couple of years after the bad winter that resulted in additional die-offs, which are reflected in the dips in statewide white-tailed deer harvest between 1997 and 2002. Without additional environmental caused die-offs, white-tailed deer harvest in Idaho rapidly recovered to 1996 levels within a five-year period with no changes to the hunting season structure. Antlerless harvest can also be an effective tool for managing mule deer and elk populations to meet abundance objectives. Here we'll use data from the Weezer River elk zone as an example. Without adequate antlerless harvest, the elk population in this zone grew beyond the upper limit of the population management objective of 5,000 cow elk, which led to increased elk-related agriculture depredations. In response, the department increased antlerless elk opportunity which reduced the antlerless portion of the population toward the objective. Antlerless harvest was again adjusted once the management objective was met to stabilize the change in abundance. In summary, antlerless harvest can be useful for deer and elk management and the health of deer and elk populations. Antlerless harvest can increase productivity, which means more bucks hitting the ground as fawns. Antlerless harvest can result in higher fawn weights, which translates to increased overwinter survival in the first year of life. Antlerless harvest can increase body condition, which means adult animals are larger and healthier and can better survive harsh winters. And lastly, 
Antlerless harvest can increase social acceptance of deer and elk where there are issues with agricultural depredations and urban wildlife conflicts. Thank you for watching this video and for having a passion for Idaho's wildlife. Check out our website for future installments on the state of deer and elk in Idaho.